Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Brent Johnson and Ira Harris. Brent is CEO of Santiago Capital, where he manages $175 million for high net worth individual families by a separately managed accounts and a private fund. He has worked for Baker Avenue Asset Management and Credit Suisse, and he lives currently in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Ira is independent trader, hedge fund manager, and global macro consultant trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003 and a stint most recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a great, great resume, and I'm looking forward to discussing a lot. So, sure. Richard, it's it's all in your hands. Great. Uh, I thought we'd begin with your macro view on the economy and the financial markets. Brent, if you wanted to discuss that. Sure. So. I think from a very big picture, um, nothing has really changed for me over the last couple of years, other than we're finally getting into what I thought would have played out by now. Um, you know, for a long time now, I've thought that we were headed towards a sovereign currency and, and debt crisis. I think that we are now in the early stages of that. When COVID hit, I initially thought that that would be the catalyst for it. Uh, it turned out that because it was kind of this globally existential event, um, Again, whether you believe it was or not, the, the powers that be believe it was. And it kind of forced the whole world to kind of work together. And um, the whole world responded in the same manner. Uh, they did QE, they did fiscal stimulus, uh, lockdowns, all these, you know, same kind, same type of, uh, you know, social health policies. And, and this, in a certain way, kicked the can down the road once again. Um, but since that time, the world is no longer cooperating to the same extent that it was. Uh, there's been bifurcations on a number of different levels, whether it's strategic or military or economic. Uh, you know, you can kind of tick down a number of different boxes, but I, I would argue that the world is now becoming less globalized rather than more globalized. And I think that trend is likely to continue. And as a result, I think this currency crisis and this debt crisis um, you know, we're, I don't think this is going to play out over a couple of weeks. I think it's probably going to play out over a couple of years, but I think we are now in the early stages of it. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're seeing across markets. Uh, you know, it, it, in many times in the past, whenever there's been a problem in one part of the world, you could go to another part of the world for some safety. And it's really kind of hard to find that right now. Uh, I tend to think that the U.S. will hold up better than the rest of the world as we get into this crisis. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a nice and easy ride for anyone, regardless of where you're located. So that's probably the best way to summarize my big uh, macro view right now. Great, interesting, and your thought, Tyra? Okay, so let's, let's jump right at it because when you say a sovereign currency and debt crisis, most people would probably look at you and go, what are you talking about? You know, yeah. it's all, it's dollar is soaring. Everything is good. Um, you know, if I, if I hear one more person, yeah, because they all come out and say, well, the strong dollar is, is good for us inflation. Why? Well, I, I think that was a seventies argument when we were coming out of a certain time period, but I, it's interesting for me to hear you say that. Cause I'm, I'm of the same mindset. I think okay. that, we are playing a dangerous game here because the dollar is a financial instrument more than it is a trade instrument for the U.S. Yeah. The U.S. is it's neg the only way to me the U.S. can benefit from a strong dollar with lower cost imports is if the world goes into a massive uh, recession and you have all these uh, people who are stuck having to finance their dollar debts and having to, just like the Chinese were doing. Uh, yeah. and when, when they would, they had so much, they had built so much capacity, they were dumping so many goods around the world because uh, they could, 
and they had to, they had to, to earn dollars so just keep pushing it so when people say oh the strong dollar i don't see it i think that's i think the, this the dollar is wreaking havoc around the globe um because of of course the fed policy so i mean i, I know this is our jumping off point but the fed policy has put everybody into being massive dollar dollar borrowers uh when interest rate you know interest rates were as low as in japan yeah you know we can argue about 10 basis points or not but u.s rates and so we, we have the world saddled with massive amounts of dollar debt and now you have a dollar that's 20 percent higher 22 percent higher uh it's actually the 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 emerging markets i mean this is how <laughs> we've turned the world on its head because typically uh Mexico, Brazil, uh, other uh, emerging market currencies would be getting whacked, but they got out in front of the Fed. So we know that uh, the uh, bank, uh, the Bank of Mexico, uh, they were they were ahead. So the emerging markets um, have actually held up pretty well, but the rest of the world is really being being hurt. So I'm uh, with the stronger dollar, uh, and I know. And if we go to what uh, Powell said on Wednesday, he doesn't care yeah. because in his mind, his model now says uh, that financial uh, tightening financial conditions is a good thing because that's going to get. But he told us that back in June, July, when he told us what he was, he said, look, it, we can't do anything about the supply. The Fed cannot do anything about supply. Even though David Rosenberg said yes, but those are those are Powell's words. We can't yeah. do anything about supply. All we can do is affect demand. And how do we affect demand? We do wealth destruction. Wealth destruction will get you demand destruction. So I guess, Brent. Then I go yeah. to. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying, and this this is the reason that I have been calling for this currency crisis for all the reasons that you just uh, you just mentioned. Um, and now I think, you know, to further your comments, we are right now in the heart of what's called Triffin's Dilemma. And Triffin's Dilemma says that if a, for, for, for people who are not familiar with this term, what, it, what, it, what it, the theory says is that if an individual country's currency is also used as the global reserve currency, there will eventually come a time where the needs of the domestic market come into conflict with the needs of the global market. And that's right where we're at. And, um, you know, Powell, who is the head of U.S. monetary policy, believes that we need higher rates and therefore likely a stronger dollar. That is not what the rest of the world needs right now. But he has said, I don't care. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of central banks, and I've been extremely critical of central banks over the years. I think they cause probably as many problems as they solve. But I would also say that Powell has been about as clearly a spoken Fed chair, as I can remember. Um, you might not like what he says. You might not believe him. You might think he will fail at what he is planning to do, but he has been crystal clear in what he plans to do. And he has been crystal clear that he doesn't care if, if what he plans to do causes a lot of pain. And so I have a hard time seeing him pivot before the pain arrives when he has already been crystal clear about that was his plan. And especially after having gotten inflation so wrong you know the last thing he wants to do is get two things wrong in a row and so i think that he is bound and determined to try to crush demand and therefore crush uh, inflation we'll, we'll see if he's successful or not but i just don't see him pivoting before that happens oh i i agree with you i i mean he lost me i i'm not a powell fan i'm very critical of powell uh because of the way he handled 2018 and he yep. wants to correct 2018 because, you know, Druckenmiller uh, said it best, even though others said it earlier, um, that it was that double shotgun shotgun approach was a gigantic mistake because he got and, he, and it's interesting that in the in his last two press conferences he he keeps reiterating that he wants to get Fed funds to a real positive yield. And I'm a yeah. real positive yield. But if yeah. you're fighting inflation, you fight it on the short end. You know, yeah. everybody keeps looking at the long end like there's some magic there, but there's not. 
it, when Volcker was busy fighting inflation, he used Fed funds and overnight money to do it. That's where you fight it. And, and the long end will respond accordingly if they yeah. believe you. Right now, the, to me, the inverted yield curve says the market believes Powell. They, they believe Powell because, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, we, longer rates are going up, but, uh, or, you know, longer duration rates. But of course, sh uh, short term rates are, their, um, their pace, of course, is, is much higher. So yes, I, I agree with you. I don't think, I don't, not looking for them to pivot until the market makes them pivot. No, that's did, exactly right. Right, which, which yeah. it did in 2000. I think the last, I think the fourth quarter 2018 yeah. is what I, what I would call Powell's paradigm. Yeah, that's a perfect way of saying it. I mean, he was very clear that whole year that he was going to raise rates and he kept raising rates and everybody kept thinking he was going to stop and he didn't. And finally the market made him stop, but he didn't stop because the people demanded it. He stopped because the market demanded it. And that that's what he will do this time. Um, you know, it's, I think it's important for people to understand that the reason central banks are there, his primary function is to step in and be the savior when the whole system comes under threat. And so if the system comes under threat and the markets break down, he will absolutely pivot. But until then, there, in, if, in, you know, the way I read him is there, there's no reason for him to do it. And there's actually, you know, if you think about it, just from a personal perspective, and I know we're supposed to think of these people as, you know, agnostic and, you know, the, put the good of the country in front of everybody else. But I mean, let's be real for a second, right? There's great, there is great risk to him personally and his reputation personally, if he were to pivot now, or if he were to stop now, and for whatever reason, inflation stays high or even accelerates higher, his personal reputation will take a huge hit, especially after getting you know, the inflation thing so wrong the first time, and then now saying he's not going to pivot until we get inflation down. If he now, you know, gives wishy-washy and does a 180 again, and for whatever reason, you know, inflation accelerates, He's he and the whole Fed is going to look ineffective. And and so to me, that's a bigger risk for him than tightening too much, causing the crash, because if, if he tightens too much and the market crashes, then he can pivot and everybody will beg him to do it. So and, and they will love it when he does it. So it, it, it would take a. I just don't, see, yeah, for all the reasons that we've already talked about, I just don't see him pivoting before that uh, market event. Mm -hmm. And um, just continuing on the, uh, the thoughts of the US dollar um, and, and these thoughts on interest rates, uh, you're well known for the dollar milkshake theory. Can, can you yes. elaborate a bit on that and uh, how that sort of factors into your current sure. thinking today? Well, it's, it's really all related to the stuff we've already been talking about. Um, the best way to think of the dollar milkshake theory is the framework for how I see a currency crisis playing out or a sovereign debt crisis playing out. Um, the whole thesis is literally a relative argument. And what I mean by that is that I think in that environment, the U.S., um, performs better on a relative basis to the rest of the year, or yes, rest of the world. Now, that does not mean things are great in the U.S. It just means they're, I think they will be better here than the rest of the world. And the, the theory basically says that if you go back to the global financial crisis, and we could probably go back a lot further than that, but just because everybody, I think, is for the most part familiar with the global financial crisis and the response to it, the last 13, 14 years have seen unprecedented monetary uh, reactions from global central banks, either providing stimulus or providing QE or the governments doing fiscal spending. There's been this incredible uh, you know, time where liquidity was provided to the market. And I kind of view that as the milkshake. And I think they're going to have to do more of that in the future. The central banks are going to have to come back and probably do more of that, uh, either uh, QE or Governments will have to do more fiscal spending, however you want to define that. But I think that the U.S., for several reasons, some of them deserved, some of them probably undeserved, 
has the straw. And I think the straw allows the U.S. to drink that milkshake that the whole world is mixing and that has been creating. And when that happens, I think that liquidity, whatever liquidity there is, and there might not be that much liquidity, but whatever liquidity there is, I think will find its way into the U.S. dollar and the U.S. markets. And that will help buoy the U.S. markets. But you also have to understand if capital is leaving those other places and coming into the U.S. dollar in the U.S., then that means those other areas are being deprived of liquidity. And I think that they will have to meet that liquidity by printing more of their own currency. So it becomes this self-reinforcing loop. Um, you know, to Ira's point earlier, initially a year ago, the Bank of Mexico and the Bank of Brazil kind of got out ahead of the Fed with rate hikes, but most other countries have lagged and you can already see it happening. I mean, so if you, if you pull up a chart of currencies over the last year, I think the ruble, um, the, 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 the real, and the peso are, are, the, are the three best, and then it's the dollar, and then everybody else is down massively, or, or most others are down massively. And the reason is, is because despite all the things that people are worried that the U.S. might have to do to support its currency one day, the rest of the world is already having to do that today. You know, Europe is still, even though they've started rate, raising rates, they're still doing QE to some extent. Japan is still doing QE to some extent. China has started loosening their monetary uh, policy. And so you're getting this situation where while the U.S. is tightening, the rest of the world is already easing, and you're seeing that reflected in currencies. Interesting. And your thoughts, Ira? Well, yeah. so uh, I want to pick up with Brent and where he goes. So we get, and I'm going to ask you, how do we get to the debt crisis? Because... Yeah. You know, I know, and, and I actually once directly asked uh, Jerome Powell at a symposium before he was Fed chair, he was just a governor who was, uh, right. in fact, it was the Monday after Brexit, believe it or not, yeah. I just yeah. happened to be, it was at the Chicago Global Initiative. And I asked him uh, two questions. Um, one was who guarantees the ECB, because he was talking about the global situation. Sure. And two was he a man and did he believe that sovereign debt should carry a zero risk weighting, mm. which I'm going to bet is your jump off point. I just have that feeling about sovereign debt yeah. because under Basel's three, it carries a zero risk weighting, which is a terrible place because yeah. because I'm hoping that we'll discuss the ECB because if there's if you well, think that yeah. The, the Japanese have a problem. The ECB is in a very, very dangerous situation here. Well, so this is, yes. And so this is how we get to the sovereign debt crisis. Um, again, we can probably go back a couple of decades, but let's just go back 15 years or even just 10 years to, to 10 years ago, coming out of the financial crisis, central banks around the world are pinned, have pinned rates either at 1% or 0% or in some cases, even negative, right? Mm -hmm. um, either through a combination of yield curve control or, you know, monetary policy or QE. And so from 2010 until 2000, let's call it 18 or 19 or even 20. Actually, you could even argue up until a year ago, sovereign um, issuers were selling bonds with either zero or negative ratings. And the buyers of these zero coupon bonds are not just the uh, you know the, the the mutual funds and the etfs that are in that space but they are the pension funds they're the banks they are the endowments um and the, they're the big institutions both in europe and japan i'll talk about europe and japan kind of simultaneously so that's fine as long as interest rates are low the problem is is then when interest rates start to rise those bonds that were issued with a zero coupon are now falling, the principal is now falling. And so all of these institutions that have huge amounts of these zero coupon bonds on their balance sheet, the, the asset side of their balance sheet um, starts to fall and the liabilities start to rise. And it's not too long before you get blowups either in the pension funds or in the endowments or in the banks themselves. And you've seen this happen already this year 
in Japan and in Europe. Well, not, not Europe too much. Um, you know, some of the peripheral yields started to get high. Um, Spain and Italy specifically, uh, you know, Greece. And, you know, you already saw Lagarde and ECB had to come out and say, even though we're going to raise rates, we are also going to create this new facility that allows us to buy peripheral bonds because they have to keep those yields down. The same thing happened in the UK. As soon as interest rates started rising, you know, you had this big blow up in the pension fund, uh, pension funds where they were totally offsides. Their balance sheet blew up and the Bank of England basically had to come in, do very uh, aggressive short-term QE to pull interest rates back down. And you've seen the same thing happen in Japan, where interest rates only went up 25 basis points. Think about that. 0.25% of 1% went up, and it caused so much problem in the Japanese banking system that they had to come out on several occasions and reiterate their commitment to having very low rates and to doing QE. And they're at this point, they're basically doing unlimited yield curve control. And as a result, when these countries do this, when Europe does this, when the UK does this, and when Japan has done this, they are fight, they're basically choosing to sacrifice the currency rather than the banking system. Because you cannot save both of them. And the reason you cannot save both of them is, is the method you would use to save one kills the other. So they have to make a choice. And ultimately, they have chosen to save the banking system and, and the bond market. And as a result, the pound is down like 15% for the year. The euro is down 15, 20% for the year. The yen is down 20% for the year. And, and, and the reason is, is because the sovereign bonds have already gotten in trouble. And I just don't see how they can ever let the sovereign bonds interest rates rise. I mean, they might rise anyway, but the central banks can't let it. They, they will have to try to fight it. And I think the way they fight it is let the currency fall. And that's why I think the dollar is going to get so much stronger. Because I think there's probably a lot of people out there at this point who have heard all of the reasons why the dollar is going to lose its value someday. You know, we've spent all this money. We can't ever pay it back. The debts are way too high. Interest rates are starting to rise. We can't service the debt. At some point, people won't trust this Ponzi scheme anymore. However, you want to define this big issue. And they're absolutely right. That is an issue for the U.S. dollar. The problem is, is that it's already an issue for all the other, other countries. And all of the things that everybody is worried about one day happening to the dollar is right now happening today in Japan, in England, and in, the, in Europe. And, and I think many other countries are going to face the same um, the, fa the, sa the same situation. And that I, I, I think at this point that the sovereign debt crisis is mostly unavoidable. That was a very long-winded answer. I apologize. No, for no, <laughs> yeah, no. It's it's a it's a great answer because it it clarifies. You know, there's just not enough talk about this, and I'm and I'm, yeah, you know, having uh, been in in school in the in the seventies and studied with really some very wonderful people uh, when I was in graduate school and discuss this from a Marxist and an Austrian actually yeah. viewpoint. And those two schools had it right. Everybody else had it wrong. They yeah. saw what the effect of OPEC was going to be, the recycling of the quote unquote petrodollars. Uh, yeah. So, and that was to me child's play. As I say, with all the debt that we have piled up, you know, I tell people, I said, Volcker couldn't have been Volcker. Because yeah. had Volcker gone that route, he would have crushed the global economy. You know, we yeah. had enough growth with Japan and, and until there wasn't. And the dollar, of course, then ran up too high. And then they had to correct that because the yeah. politics within the United States didn't allow for it because we were hollowing out, which is kind of interesting here because you bring it, bring that up. And uh, through... Uh, the Financial Repression Authority, whose good auspices we're using today. Okay. Uh, I had the pleasure of sitting with the yen. Because to me, the yen is a real problem for the world. Because whatever's going on, right? It, I mean, if I take a real yield basis, I could argue that. Japanese rates are probably about equivalent to US rates on a real basis. But of course, we know that Japanese institutions scour the globe 
looking for nominal returns. And, right. they're, and if they're not hedging, it's been a great year for them. But I don't think, but they do so much hedging. Yeah. But the yen, and Lewis argued, and, and I think it's the every day that goes by, I think it makes more and more sense. Lewis thought that the weak yen was going to do a lot to supplant the Europeans out of China because Germany has such a huge footprint. And it's interesting because here we are talking about it. And who last week, Olaf Scholz uh, yeah. goes to China by himself, except, yeah. I'm sorry, except for Siemens, BA, BASF, <laughs> uh, all the big German yeah. corporations, but none of his European cohorts and nobody from the US, what was he doing? Well, yeah. we have a, he's the Germans, I think are very, are really getting nervous. And more importantly, is that the finance minister, uh, Lindner, is actually a, a, as close to a free market capitalist as you're going to find on the European continent. And I'm sure they're they're hearing it and they're very concerned about it. But this week, the, the Japanese are getting away with murder because they're 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 getting a, a huge positioning. I back in the 80s and 90s when I when when uh, the when when uh, Toyota came out with Lexus and you could see that they were directed right at Mercedes yeah, yeah. right the, yep. the car was absolutely I call it the Mercedes uh, Toyota Lexus spread and yeah. right now they are building themselves back up because they howled themselves out as the end was way too strong for too long and they've moved a lot of business to to Japan, to Vietnam. Now we're going to start to see some changes. I look at that Euro yen cross and, it, and yes, the Euro has dropped 15% against the dollar, but the Euro has gained 13% this year against the yen. Yeah. So they're yeah. in a more, so I, I, well, I so this is, that. this is where I'm glad you brought this up because this is where my whole thesis kind of starts to leave finance a little bit and starts to get more in the geopolitical arena. And what I mean by that is because it's now a sovereign debt crisis, it's a geopolitical crisis, right? And because of the bifurcation between East and West, Russia and China partnering up, you know, US, US and Europe still together, you know, U.S. versus Russia, U.S. versus China, however you want to define that. But again, the world is moving away from each other uh, geopolitically. We're, we're, we're cooperating less and tensions are running high. Um, energy prices have, have caused a crisis, you know, between East and West as well. China needs energy. Russia has it. Europe needs energy. Russia has it. And the U.S. has it. So, you know, you've got all these you've got all these uh, flashpoints. And, and I believe that because it's now at the sovereign level, I think that the, the strong dollar suits the US because what it does is it destabilizes many countries on the periphery and on the edge. And so because sides are being chosen, and of course each side wants as many people on their side to fight the other side, if the US can put some countries that are on the margin in, in, in a pressure point, then they can kind of cajole them over to their side or they can influence them over to their side. And, and if they don't come to their side, well, then they don't get U.S. dollar funding or they don't get help with, with their trade deals or they don't get, don't get help geopolitically. And therefore, you know, their, their economies start to suffer. And so I, I don't know that they're necessarily doing it as the primary reason, but I think the U.S. understands that the strong dollar, the, the, the secondary effects of the strong dollar help them from a geopolitical perspective. So, so this is interesting because I have this ongoing, I've been having this ongoing discussion argument with a, a friend of mine, Andrew Perry, who has a, who, from Australia, and he's, Andrew has a, a, a great pedigree in global macro, and he believes that the, that the, the U.S. is using this dollar as a cudgel. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with him. Totally. You, you see, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm not and, in school. Well, well, think about this. Think about the, it, you basically need energy in order to have industry, right? Okay, so if you need energy to have industry, and now in Germany and Europe is having trouble getting energy, or they get energy at the benefit of the United States because they're not getting it from Russia anymore, that means their industries start to suffer. If the U.S. wants to build its industry back up, I mean, they, they can use energy to kind of help do that. 
at the same time, to your point, that the, 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 the European industry is under pressure, Japanese industry, you know, maybe the U.S. is helping them. I mean, I can't imagine that the Fed allowed, and I say allowed because I do think that there is a hierarchy among central banks, and to a certain extent, the U.S. can kind of direct other central banks what to do or how to do it. I don't think there's any way in the world that the yen was written down by 20 or 30 percent and the Fed didn't say, OK, go ahead and do it. I, to me, that just doesn't happen, a move like on that big without having some very deep discussions amongst the Fed and the Bank of Japan. Um, now, none of this can be proven, and perhaps I'm wrong, but I think there's enough signals there that uh, at least make me take a very close look at it. No, I, you, I, uh, I listen, I, I'm a big believer in that, especially when it comes to the Japanese, because when the Japanese want to move, move something, and I could go and, and point directly at it, October of 2012, coming out of the, usually at the G7 or IMF, they get a nod and a wink, and yep. you saw that with Abe's three arrows. Yeah, they needed exactly. a weaker yen, right? Yep. Yep. Right. Right out of the G7. In fact, it was one of. Uh, I, I actually blogged about it on that weekend. It was a Sunday. I go, wow. It just seems to be. And and um, dollar yen started to move up from seventy nine yeah. eighty to the dollar all the way up, and it was done with the OK. Yeah. Well, and then think about think about what a strong dollar and a weak yen does to China, right? China. It, you know, if you look at a if you if you look at a ten year chart of the yen and the yuan, I have and, it. I and, have it up in front of me. Yes. Okay. So in 2013, the yen got weak, and the yuan eventually followed it weaker because they're competing on a regional basis for exports. In 2015, the yen got very weak, and the and the old yuan, China ultimately had the mini deval on the yuan as a result. So this year, when the yen started falling, I was at a conference in April and I said, the yen is the most important thing in the world right now, because if it continues to fall, China is going to have to let the yuan follow it. And that's exactly what's happened. The yen took another dive and the yuan is now at a three or four year low um, as a result. And so, you know, now you've got China is fighting dual problems. It's kind of like the, you know, you can't save both the currency market and the debt market, but with China, they have a real estate market that is way over levered. They've got huge deflationary pressure, but the problem is, is now their currency is weak and they have high inflationary pressures. So how do they solve it? If they, if they loosen monetary policy to save the, the real estate market, then the inflation goes through the roof and they start to get so social problems. Or, but if they, if they make the, the yuan stronger to, to try to tamp down the inflation, then the real estate market crashes. So you've got all of these, you know, cross currents all over the world, and I feel like when I talk to a lot of people, they're 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 already in the absolutely inflationary camp or absolutely deflationary camp, and I can make an argument for either one. So I try not to be too pigeonholed in either camp because this thing can I think can fall either way, and I think you just need to understand the dynamics of how each of them can happen. I, if Richard, if I may, I know you're you're yeah. going to jump in there, so. I love that we're having this discussion because the yuan yen is at all time highs. I'm not yeah. talking about. No, yeah. I know. When, when I look at the yuan, I only measure it from January 1st, 1994, the day that China right. devalued 50%. Sure. What took place during uh, the initial decade of Deng Xiaoping, uh, yeah. certainly under Mao, I could care. I don't care yeah. one iota. Uh, but January 1st, 1994, when they devalued on the same day that NAFTA started. Gee, imagine yep. that. <laughs> uh, uh, so actually, we've been looking at the yuan pe uh, peso, which is now going to get yeah. interesting, especially very, as- Very, very much. Very right? interesting. Reshoring. Yep. Uh, yep. I, have yep. A, I have a friend, Mark Plum, who used to build factories in uh, China, and now he's moved moved his consulting business to many other places. So. Um, we, so we have all these things, and yeah, you're right. But yet, even with even with the recent yuan weakness, which is really important, because if we go back during COVID, the the Chinese were very methodical. The yuan yeah. actually rallied. Everybody was a looking lot. For it, it rallied a lot. Yeah, a lot. It was the strongest yeah. currency yeah. because you know, in the Michael Pettis argument, China was definitely trying to move to a more middle 
class consumer oriented economy and you need a stronger sure. currency. Sure. And they were busy stockpiling everything that they everything. possibly could yep. want, right? Yep, yep. Now they still need that middle class economy, but the currency is really weak. Uh, yeah, except, it's it. yeah. Except it's at all time highs against the yen. Yeah, you think about you think about how much they've let it weaken this year, and it's still at its all time high versus the end. It's a very big deal. I'm I'm really glad that you pointed that out because I think I think that's lost on a lot of people. Sorry, Richard. And, oh yeah, no, no, that's good. Uh, coming back to, on the sovereign debt crisis. So, um, if we look at uh, what's happening uh, in, in the bond markets, UK, Europe, and Japan. Uh, Brent, are you seeing any like international capital flows to the U.S. Um, as you mentioned, uh, but uh, is it going into different uh, like on equities? Is it going into sectors or is it going into the Dow equities? Well, uh, I, or, it's, I, I don't necessarily have a good, you know, hard number for you as far as flows coming in. But I think the anecdotal evidence is that, you know, Money is coming out of the bond market. So foreigners are selling their U.S. treasuries in order to get their dollars because they need dollars, right? But when I look around the world, money is not flowing into China, right? You, you, you don't get a higher yield by buying a Chinese treasury than a U.S. treasury. So despite what you may feel about China and, and the United States, global institutions are not putting their hard-earned capital with Chinese treasuries over U.S. treasuries. So even though U.S. treasuries might be selling off, it's not because they're selling U.S. treasuries and buying Chinese treasuries or something along those lines. Um, I think capital is leaving China. Um, I think that's part of the reason that the that they are having as much trouble as they are. I think I think capital, <coughs> excuse me, I think capital is leaving Europe. Um, if you look at their monetary policy and they've got a you know they've got a war on their doorstep. I can't imagine global capital is fleeing to Europe as a safe haven. Um, and meanwhile, the U.S. is raising interest rates. You know, you on a on a you, you get be, because the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. You get paid more to hold the currency that you have to have to operate on a global basis. And I think that's partly why you've seen the dollar as strong as it is. And there will no doubt be periods of time, maybe a month, two months at a time where the dollar will pull back, you know, and you'll see some short term outflows and maybe the Fed at some point will pivot and that will give, you know, some of these other currencies a little bit of a tailwind. But the reality is, is the rest of the world has, if the U.S. pivots, the rest of the world is going to have to pivot too. There is not a scenario where the U.S. goes into a deep recession and the rest of the world experiences growth. It, it just doesn't work that way. And so I, I can't figure out a way where the dollar goes down and stays down for a material period of time, unless the U.S. decides that it wants it lower. And right now, I don't think that they want it lower. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, Aaron? I know. I, it's, I mean, there's there's so much there's so much here, and and all that is is absolutely right. You know, but again, and we come back to 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 me, real yields. It'll always be real yields. I know. I know. I know that there's phenomenal money that chases nominal yields, but when I look at Europe, yeah, so let's conservatively say the inflation is 8% in Europe. Uh, overnight rate, well, deposit rates at the ECB are 2%. So we're so vastly negative in, in real yield yeah. terms. And, and as Brent talked about, they're going nowhere. I mean, Christine Lagarde has a major problem on her hands. She's been suffering uh, to me since last December. You could see the stress because when uh, Viedman left or announced that he was leaving come January, he left. And now you got uh, Joaquin Nagel, who's probably more hawkish than Viedman was because Viedman, I think, was more of a politician. But you have the Hanseatic Five who are pushing at her. Yep. And she cannot, she, she said, Twice, these are two meetings in a row. There is no quantitative tightening. So she's yep. willing to let overnight rates go, I think, as the buy-off to no quantitative tightening. So if, even if Europe went to 5%, there's nothing good in Europe anyway. And they'll, they'll bring themselves to a major problem. You can already see what's happening. Uh, I mean, she can't go to quantitative tightening because look at the Italian yields are at, what, 4.5% on the 10-year? They yeah. can't live with four and a half. They, 
their debt load. And that's why she can't go to quantitative tightening because she has to be there to keep absorbing all the paper that nobody else wants. And, and you know yeah. what? Under Target 2, the Bundesbank has a problem to begin with. And wait till it really becomes political in Germany. We haven't really seen it yet, but yeah. it's, it, it's- You know what? That's okay. I'm, you, I think you and I are thinking of all the same things because I think it's really important for listeners to understand this. The tried and true method for getting out of being over indebted by governments is to inflate the debt away. So, and it's happened throughout history. And ultimately that is what happens. And so I think a lot of people over the last couple of years have, have come to the conclusion, well, the central banks are just going to hold rates low. They're going to print a bunch of money and we're going to have inflation and it's just going to get inflated away. And the thing is that works really, really good in a spreadsheet. The problem is, is that when you get inflation at the levels that we're seeing it, you get pushback from the people that you're trying to govern. It is politically very, very difficult to get it for there's two parts to this one if the central banks could engineer three to four percent inflation on a very consistent basis over 10 years they would love it because then you know inflation's a little bit of a problem but it's not such so much a problem that the pitchforks are out and they're trying to hang you but when you have inflation at eight percent ten percent fifteen percent seventy percent like you're seeing in turkey the people don't just sit there and take it. They start to push back. So, and, and the other thing is it's very hard to get consistent three or 4% inflation. You know, it's like the whole toothpaste tube, you pound on it or the ketchup, right? You shake it and you shake and shake and you get no inflation. Then all of a sudden it just comes running out. And that's, that's exactly what we've seen. Um, so, so that's the one point that I want to make uh, that financial impression is a great plan, but it's very, very hard to do and keep society happy. Um, the second thing that I want, this is a little bit off topic, but it's important to understand it is that, you know, what I think the strong dollar is what causes, you know, this currency crisis. And the argument that I will often get is why doesn't the rest of the world just leave the dollar? And I say, because they have to service the dollar debt. And they say, well, why don't they just default on all of their dollar debt? And then they don't have to service it anymore. That demand for the dollar is gone and the dollar will fall. The key thing to understand and the reason that doesn't work is the dollar debt that exists outside the United States was not, for the most part, loaned to them from the United States. So the euro dollar debt that's outside the United States is also the euro dollar assets outside the United States. It's a French bank making a loan to Turkey. It's a Japanese bank making a loan to someone in Thailand. It's a Brazilian bank making a loan to somebody in Paraguay or, or Bolivia. And so... Mm -hmm. And they denominate it in dollars because that's the global reserve currency. So if the rest of the world just defaults on this dollar debt, that means the assets of the rest of the world are just going up in smoke as well. So this whole idea of just leaving the dollar and going to a new BRICS currency or some new basket or some new you know, payment system, it's just much, much harder to do in the real world than it, than it is in theory. And the example that I use that I, that I hope people helps people understand this is look at all the green initiatives um, for energy that have been put in place over the last four or five years, 10 years. You know, we're going to mandate to shut down coal plants. We're going to mandate that you use wind and solar. I mean, it, it all sounds fantastic. And, and on a spreadsheet or in a report, it works wonderful. The problem is that in the real world, it's just not ready yet. And if a crisis hits before that new system is ready, like what we have right now, it blows the whole thing up. And it's the same thing with these, you know, a potentially new currency system or a potential new payment system or a, a, a new trade block that's going to unseat the dollar. It sounds great in theory, but the world's just not ready for it. And it's not ready to go. And if the crisis hits before it's ready to go, the same thing's going to happen to the dollar that happened to the price of energy. It's going to spike because everybody needs it and nobody has it. And so I, I just don't think that our leaders, both domestic and international, are smart enough to figure this out without going through a lot of pain. And listen, if they can figure this out and they can move the markets down the road for another 10 or 15 years without a crisis, I will actually be happy for that. I'm not looking forward to this crisis. I just don't think that they have the ability to get away from it. So, you know, I, Brent, and we have 
two new, we have a recent example. When this, and, and that's my problem with the strong dollar because they're not really paying attention. And this is Yellen, who's the secretary of trade. I mean, they, as, as Powell would say, that's her value. That's not my value. I yeah. have to worry about my dual mandates. The dollar yeah. is the treasuries. I, I get it. All you do is have to look at Switzerland in 2015. There was a peg in place. Yeah. People had borrowed a relatively a lot of money because the Swiss interest rates were so low because that was part <laughs> of keeping that peg in place. Yep. And then when it blew, we're, they're still resolving this issue. Yep. Now, Larry Summers, I'm not always in agreement with him, very rarely, but he's been pretty right. And he, and he warned, he wrote a Bloomberg piece a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, uh, from the year from uh, October 24th, summer's, uh, summer's watching Japan very carefully because of the huge amount of money that flows around the world. So I, your point is so well taken because once you go and this starts to take place, you are going to get massive debt defaults. You know, yeah. the, the, the inflation will become a sideshow. And and a, and a and a a very critical point, a place in the world for me is Europe, because if the politics in Germany turn right, we we've now mm -hmm. seen the year the Italian elections. We see certain fissures in the political structure in in France. Macron, I'm not sure he's strong enough to pull this off, and there's a lot of underlying uh, dissension going on, and and if, you know, and everybody says, well. You know, well, you know, but what if Germany said no, that we're not bankrolling it? Because listen, yeah. European rates are only European rates because everybody believes that Germany is the ultimate credit card for the whole yeah. ECB, pro for the whole yeah. EU project. But if Germany, if Germany were to walk away and say, or, you know, I know it's very hypothetical, they don't even have to just walk away. But if they started to see fears like we saw in 2012 with Greece and uh, Spain, you know, uh, Portugal, what they call the proverbial pigs. If you had that now, the your debt crisis would be here, and that debt crisis yeah. would resonate throughout the world and cause a massive debt default, which yeah. is deflationary, and its impact. It's everything that Ben Bernanke has, you know, railed against, you know, for, for certainly since two thousand and two, and what he feared. And that's why, you know, I tongue in cheek when I was, uh, I, I did a podcast with the FRA on Thursday with Peter Bookvar and Dave Rosenberg, and we talked about it. And I said, you know, everybody talks about that Powell is seeking his inner Volcker. But when you listen to him at the press conference and his desire to bring uh, a tightening in financial conditions, to me, he's searching for his inner uh, Andrew Mellon. And, and he wants yeah. to liquidate, liquidate, yeah. liquidate. No, I, right? that's a that's a, that's a good distinction. I agree. So well, let, let me let, let me let me give you another scenario before I forget. So we've talked about how far the yen has fallen this year, right? And how, mm -hmm. how big of a deal that is. And I, and to, to me, the yen continues to be the most important thing. And here's the here's why. If it continues to fall, it's going to continue to put the pressure on the rest of the world like it has all year. But let's flip it around. Let's pretend the yen strengthens. I mean, it's down 25% in a year. Imagine it strengthens 10% from here, which was, which I think people need to, because I don't think people tend to follow currencies very much and they're very familiar with following stocks. A 10, 20, 30% doesn't seem like that big of a deal. A 20% move in a currency, especially one as big as the dollar or the yen or the euro, these are huge, enormous moves, extremely unusual. So, my point is, is that the fact that it's down 20 to 25% over the last year, it could easily have a dead cat bounce of 5 or 10%. Now, a 5 or 10% move, again, in the currency, that's a big move. And if the yen is rallying 5 or 10%, that means money is flowing from the rest of the world back into the yen. It doesn't just go up and up without the flow of funds changing, right? The reason it's going up is funds are flowing back into the yen. Well, the funds are flowing into the yen. That means it's coming from somewhere else. And that means it's leaving Europe. It's leaving maybe the US. Maybe it's leaving other parts of Asia. And so now it's, and, but all of these other areas need liquidity, right? 
So now all of a sudden you get a yin rally and you get a starvation of liquidity that could that itself. That, so the, my point is, is the yin strengthening could cause as much chaos as the yin weakening. And there's just no good solution from here. No, no yeah, it's, yeah, the yen is <laughs> front and foremost. And I keep talking yeah. about the yen and, everybody, and everybody is bought into this. Well, the yen's going to go uh, down yen higher, higher, higher. And we saw it got to 152. And then all of a sudden, Kuroda said, OK, you know what? Because he was getting pressure. And I'm sure he was getting pressure from other members of the G7. Because oh, the Japanese sure. ha have, and, and they evidently, evidently have something here, and, and I go back to Louis Gavet, and I think Louis is on to something. And again, uh, that maybe they are trying to squeeze Europe out of China. You know, yeah. with, with all the, the, there's definitely realignments, as you talked about at the beginning of this conversation. There are massive realignments getting ready to take place. Yeah. Well, part, part of, I mean, here's, this starts to get a little conspiratorial, and I, so I fully admit this, but you know, if, if you read back all these ge geopolitical strategy books and theories, it's like there's the global island, which is, you know, Europe and Asia, right? And whoever controls the global island controls the world. And a big part of that has always been Eastern Europe staying going with Russia and China rather than Europe, Western Europe, right? And so the last thing that the U.S. probably wants is Russia and China and Germany and you know and some and their industry you know to team up so you know the last thing that the west would want to happen is for that to happen so i i tend to agree with what you're saying is like you know it's kind of these and it's hard it's hard to for people to think that why would you do that to your friend why would you do that to your ally ally well you wouldn't necessarily willingly do it but if you had to do it to cement your place then you might you know like there's that saying like there's no there's no friends on the, at the geopolitical level. There's just uh, similar interests or something to that right, effect, right? Right. Yeah. And I don't remember the exact quote, but it's something like that. Well, there, there's the quote from uh, what's his name Wilson, who was the uh, chairman of uh, General Motors in the '50s, and said America doesn't have any friends; and it only only has interests. There you go. Maybe that that's right? probably yeah, what so, I'm thinking about. So, yeah. uh, but but then you think about it with the United States, and the United States is getting heat today. From the Europeans, oh, oh, absolutely. right? On, absolutely. on the uh, Inflation Recovery Act, which gives under um, uh, uh, WTO rules, they're they're in violation of WTO rules because they're subsidizing certain industries uh, to to make movement at and and it's and the Europeans are screaming about it, but the Japanese who are sitting there as a bastion of Asia, which is the manufacturing uh, center of the world at this point in time. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Japan hasn't really done that well, even though there is such an advanced, highly advanced, uh, re-engineered economy. That's how they're, they compete directly with Germany. But what better way to grab some of those chip manufacturers than with a depreciated currency, right? Right. I, I keep thinking about that. So yeah. it's not conspiratorial in when you when you're managing money. Well, yeah, if, yeah. I mean, I if I listen, I mean, I if I was a big U.S. blue chip company, I would be looking all over the world for beat up companies that are struggling and that are distressed sellers and buy them with my very strong dollar. Yeah, we're back to the '60s when we yeah. have an overvalued yeah. currency. Yeah. And you use it right. That's yeah. what you do with an overvalued currency. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hell, I, I wrote my master's thesis on exactly that on multinational <laughs> corporations and yeah. how the French were screaming because IBM was buying machine bull and U.S. corporations were traveling the world with their overvalued currency, looking for cheaper assets. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I, I tend to agree. I like I said, this is all. It, to me, it's the most. I mean, I've been doing this for almost twenty-five years now. And I remember in the mid 90s, when I was in business school, me and some friends used to talk about how everything was pretty calm now that wasn't it was kind of boring, there wasn't that much going on. You know, it seemed like all the really cool stuff in history happened before we were born. And now I, I think back to those conversations and how naive I was, because I think this is going to be more exciting than any of those. I don't know if it's going to be fun, but it's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that it's going to be fun. Because there's so many things going on right now that 
uh, I think uh, we do, and, and the movements are afoot, you know, and, and as Trotsky said, wars are the locomotive of history. You know, unfortunately, and, and, that's unfortunately and, true, right? And here we have a war which is yeah. reflecting the amount of uh, dissension that exists in the world. And, yeah. you know, you know uh, so out of this war will come different realignments. Um, yeah. we're, we're, we're living it. But I think that because of the past policies of the last decade, especially with the Fed's policies of zero interest rates, which, which uh, gave, gave uh, you know, to use a football, they, they, they were able to, to block for, for the ECB, for the BOE. Japan was able to continue on there because, hey, the Fed is doing it. Now, interestingly, I, was, I went back and if you look at 2013 and 14, when the dollar was getting hit pretty good because of the policies, it didn't generate inflation. It generated yeah. asset inflation, but we didn't get inflation. So you know that's my response back to people who say, well, the stronger dollar will will prevent U.S. inflation. No, I said no, it won't. It won't only if you bring the world to an absolute uh, financial yeah. economic crisis. Then it will. Yeah. You because you'll break the world and you'll go into a into what they feared most, which is a debt deflation, which is yeah. where your starting point was. Well, and part, part of me thinks is like, you know, these these central bankers are so arrogant, they feel like if they cause that, they can just turn around and save it, right? We have the tools to save it, you know? Oh, you know what? I, I can't, I can't, agree. and it is an arrogance. And I'll tell you, yeah. it's funny because uh, I was reading, I was up early this morning, so the new November, December foreign affairs and Rogoff has an article in there talking about inflation. And I'm I'm not a fan of Rogoff. I read this time is different. And the whole premise of it was because he wrote it with Reinhardt, with Carmen Reinhardt. And I think Carmen Reinhardt's work on financial repression is second to none. I mean, mm -hmm. I've read her papers from the 40s and 50s with Operation Twist and everything that the Fed did. And and the whole premise really comes down to, well, we can carry the debt. Yes, if you get to 95% debt to GDP level, you get to a danger point. But the yeah. way out is to a few years of 4 to 6% inflation. Yeah. That's what he says. That's yeah. the solution. No, yeah. And then he writes his piece in, in uh, Foreign Affairs about inflation. And it's like he never said it. He, yeah. he goes off on other tangents, attacking other things. I go, wait a minute. Why don't you just say what you what your yeah, yeah. solution? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's it's a fascinating time. I think uh, if I was going to leave uh, people with uh, with a summary of how I see it and and a recommendation, is that the summary of the way I see things is we've kicked not just us. The whole world has kicked all of these different problems down the road. We fiscal problems economic problems, social problems, uh, energy problems, you know, how it, all these different problems we've kicked down the road. And now it's like all the countries are coming into the same intersection and it's a big pile of cans, right? It's not just one or two cans. It's yeah. all of these cans that all of the countries have picked down. And that intersection is called Trippin's Dilemma. And I just don't think they can solve it. <laughs> yeah, you know, what? It, it, uh, yeah. Right. I, I'm just, I'm so glad I'm having it right. Trippin's dilemma yeah. is such a, uh, and it was yeah. the major, it was the mainstay of global macro back in the seventies yeah. and eighties, you know? Yeah. So, um, and, and this is not new. This, this is no, all. It's not. New. That's the thing. It's not different this time. It's, it's, it's never, <laughs> it's, it's never, never different. Is. And the way out. And you know what? The only thing is, I think that the central banks, which had built up a lot of credibility, have really destroyed their credibility. Yeah, I think that's there's, there's as, as Peter Bookbar would say, by a thousand cuts because they keep yeah. and and you're and you, I I can't agree with you more. It's about arrogance because remember they told us to, to be quiet when they yeah. were financially repressing <laughs> us. Yellen and Bernanke both said it. Stop crying. Stop crying. Because yeah. Yeah, I have that paper here too. When uh, what's his name wrote a pit wrote a letter to, uh, uh, when Ralph Nader wrote a letter of all people to Yellen back in 2017 or 2015, 
complaining how savers were getting crushed. And yeah. Yellen and Bernanke both had the same phrase, base, same statement. Stop your crying. Yeah. Your house Basically. prices are up. Yeah. Your pensions are up. Your stock, your portfolio is up. Yeah. And your grandkids. Just say, just say thank you, right? Just right. say thank you. Exactly. You don't, <laughs> you don't know how much good we've done for you. Yeah. Well, just a, a quick um, final question, uh, Brent. Like, yeah. given all these trends and risks, uh, where do you see the investment opportunities or, or trading opportunities? Is it in like <coughs> Japan? Companies that are like the the uh, the, the German exporters we, we referenced. No, well, so I mean, really, I, I kind of know the question you're asking here, and I, I meant to say this at the end of my last statement is that I think the recommendation I would give to people, I'll give you kind of two two kind of broad recommendations. I have to be very careful about giving giving advice over thing because I'm regulated by two different entities. Yeah. Yeah. But Absolutely. the first thing I would say is don't get married to any one view. Um, the inflation or deflation, just keep an open mind, try to stay nimble. You know, there's nothing, even though we're in an inflationary environment, there's nothing wrong with having some cash on the sidelines. It'll give you peace of mind. It'll allow you to be opportunistic. And if we get some kind of a big sell off somewhere, you can use that to maybe go in and buy things at a really good price. Um, and the second thing I would say that my recommendation, just from a big picture perspective, and it's what I'm doing and what I'm doing for my clients is I'm focusing on the, the investments that we do have are centered in the U.S. Uh, I think on a relative basis, the U.S. will outperform the rest of the world. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be nice. It doesn't mean it's going to be fun. But I just think as this, you know, Trippin's dilemma plays out, I think the U.S. will get through this intersection better than the rest of the world. At some point, I will pivot <laughs> like Powell, and I will probably want to get out of U.S. assets and go somewhere else. But as of right now, I think that's the best way to go. Interesting. Great. And your thoughts, Ira? For no, I, I, you know, I think we, we've summed this up very well. You know, I still think that uh, the inflation theme is is the dominant theme. But to to paraphrase uh, Louis Gave, my clients don't pay me to forecast; they pay me to adapt. So okay. let's adapt. Right on. Uh, That's a great quote. That's yeah, great, well, Lewis, I mean, I was, I use it all the time and I attribute it to him because I learned the right way to be an academic and you always footnote and give credit to her. And, and that yep. is such a great, a great uh, comment. And, and that's what we, and that's what we have to do. And I'm looking at the map in your background. Yeah. So I know you're steeped in it because maps tell us so much, right? Yep. I don't yep. know what that's yep. a map of. It it's a like map it's of the it's a map of the Camino de Santiago, which is an ancient pilgrimage route across across Spain. Yeah. Well, what what what's the date? About fifteen eighty? Is that an original map? No, no, it's a it's a print, but it's uh yeah, it's I think it is back in the sixteen fifty sixteen forty eight. So what, it's what? Uh, yeah, Wait, but that, that 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 road has been there for for a thousand years. He's getting something. Hold on, I, I will I will bring a map. Okay. Can, oh, there you go. And this is from 1650. Where is it? I can't read it. It's it's Palestine. Oh, and there you go. All right. It's original map. Uh, wow. By uh, Thomas Fuller, and it's cool. in, uh, so it's interesting because again, same thing, same kind of ships, Amazing. everything offshore. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. It fascinates. So I, I saw I, that. I, I, I love, I love old maps. I, I could look at old maps all day. I, I have a map back there too of all the initial railroads in the uh, north, in the New England area. That's a good one. That's a good United one. I like States. that. Yeah. Good. So I love maps too. You know why? Because when they drew them up, they weren't lying. Yeah. Right. right. What you see is yeah. what they saw. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. So I like to look good. at them. Well, um, it's been, it's been fun. This has been great. I hope we do it again, yeah. uh, our first time. But Richard, uh, really, the Financial Repression Authority, they're, they're so aptly named that they're right on target for all the things that we're looking at. Thank, thank you so much, Brent and Ira. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Brent. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only. 
and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 